Um, well, this week we're actually going to be moving into Titus. If you don't have a Bible and you'd like to grab one, there's some up here if you don't have one. If you're in middle school or you're ADD and you want something to look at to keep you focused, uh, come grab one of those high, middle school students, high school students to kind of help you with that. Uh, or Chuck, Chuck I probably needed one last service. Um, but this morning we're in part three of four in our series through the book of Titus, okay? And, and last week we kind of took a little skip break from that as we looked at, had Sarah here and she talked about anger. Uh, and so now we're going to return to Titus for this week and next week. And if you kind of haven't been around or you missed, missed it, I want to give you a little back, get you back up to speed. Uh, this is a letter. It's a personal letter that the Apostle Paul writes to this guy named Titus. And Titus is kind of his ministry protege. Uh, he's a Gentile who has come to faith in Jesus that Paul has taken under his wing and is kind of showing him how to do ministry. And so Paul has left Titus on the Mediterranean, Mediterranean island of Crete. And the reason he's left him on Crete is because of this, Titus 1.5. He says, the reason that I left you on Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished. And that you might appoint elders in every town as I directed you. You see, Paul and his team have gone through the island of Crete, and many of these Gentiles and some probably Jews were coming to faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior like Titus had. And the problem was that because they were young in their faith, they were easily influenceable. And so depending on who they were listening to and who they were being taught by, they might be misled or misdirected. And so Paul's like, listen, Titus, you need to go onto this island. You need to go to all these house churches. You need to make sure you appoint leadership and eldership and guidance to people who will appoint these people, these new believers, in the right direction. Because there's all kinds of false teachers, false influencers who are going to lead them astray. So appoint people that will put them in the right direction. And i got to be honest with you, Paul has left Titus with a pretty difficult task. This is not going to be an easy thing to do. Because the people of Crete, the Cretans, had quite the reputation. They had earned quite the reputa reputation as being very, very difficult people to work with. In fact, they were kind of world-renowned for three different things. And one of them is that they were just known as being liars. Like, you cannot listen to anything these people say because when they speak, they lie. So don't trust these people. So, hey, go to these people and help guide them, even though they're a bunch of liars. Uh, they're also referred to as wild animals, saying basically these people are untamable. They're, they're just kind of doing whatever they want. You can't control them. Uh, and so that's who they are. And the last one, he says, these people are a bunch of lazy gluttons. Like, they hate to work, and they love to eat and drink and party, and then do absolutely nothing all day. Like, that's what they would do if they could. they do it every single day. And it, it kind of reminds me, because that's I, I had an experience with that, because last weekend, if you don't know, wasn't here, uh, because Kimberly and I were away for four days. We went down to Cancun, Mexico, to stay on an all-inclusive resort uh, to basically celebrate our 50th birthdays. We both turned 50 this year, and it was our 25th anniversary. So we kind of commented it all up and said, let's do something we've never done before. Let's go to an all-inclusive resort. And, and I got to tell you, this place was fantastic, okay? It was, it was unreal. It was beautiful. Uh, we've never done anything like this, uh, probably for one reason, because all-inclusive, we just always thought it would be kind of a waste on us because for personal reasons and personal convictions, uh, we don't drink alcohol. And so we kind of figure if you go to an all-inclusive place, you're pretty much going there so you can drink, and that's where you, you, know, you get your money's worth. Uh, and so we kind of just felt like it didn't, wouldn't work for us. Um, so every time we would go to one of the restaurants and we would order a drink and we would say, can we have a Shirley Temple? Uh, if you don't know what Shirley Temple is, it's a ginger ale or 7-Up or Sprite uh, with some cherry flavor in it, uh, and they're delicious, right? And so we're like splurging, but the people are looking at us like, wait, did you say you're 50? Like... Are, are you 50 or are you 5? Like, what are you, what are you doing here? Like, grow up. Uh, I think they were confused. They're like, you need to go next door, the Nickelodeon place next door, go hang out with SpongeBob, and you can drink Shirley Temples all day long. Uh, and so we were there ordering our Shirley Temples and having a great time and, and basically living like Cretans because we would go to every single one of these delicious meals and it was like we were just gorging ourselves, right? We we're just gorging ourselves. Uh, so like every single meal, it was, it was two appetizers. We never ordered appetizers. Two appetizers, and then there was two entrees. There was two desserts. We never ordered dessert anywhere, right? And, and that was just for me, okay? And we're talking double up every single time because I can't decide. I'll take two of those, two of those, and two of those, right? And then about four Shirley Temples, and we'll call it even, right? And then we would roll out of the place, and we would roll onto a lounge chair by the pool, uh, and then we'd sleep it off and swim a little bit and soak up some rays, and then it'd be like, oh, it's 
it's time for dinner, right? Uh, and then we did two appetizers, two entrees, right? That's kind of what we did for four days. Uh, in fact, after four days, <laughs> believe it or not, in four days, we actually, between the two of us, gained eight pounds, okay? <laughs> eight pounds. She, went, she got more than I did. Um, <clears throat> eight pounds, right? In four days, which made me think, like, if this was our lifestyle, if this is what we did every day, like, it would be no time before we would be sumo-sized, right? Right? We would just look like sumo wrestlers because we would just gain four pounds, like, every four days. Like, that's not a good thing. Not healthy, right? To live like a Cretan. Well, Titus's mission, if you will, is to go around to these different house churches, and it says to put in order, straighten them out. They're believing incorrect things. They're being led astray by following bad influences. And so you need to appoint elders who are going to point them in the right direction, people that they can follow and that they can trust, right? Because these young Cretan believers, if you think about it, they were predisposed, if you will, culturally to becoming liars and wild animals and lazy gluttons. And left untouched, that's what they would become. And Paul's like, that's not the direction we want them to go. We want them to go towards Christ. And so he's saying, hey, we need to direct them. And as we've been saying, if you've been here since week one of the series, we've been saying, here's why. Because who you follow determines where you end up. Who you follow, who you listen to, who you're getting guidance from will determine where you end up. So we've been asking these two questions. Who are you following and where are they leading you? And who is following you, and where are you leading them? Because leadership is mission critical, and who you choose to appoint eldership, leadership, guide, you know, leader, whatever it may be, influence, authority in your life will determine where you end up. And so as Jesus said, look at the fruit. As Paul talks about, he says, consider the outcome of their way of life. Are they leading you towards Christ or away from Christ? Are they teaching you what is proper and right and godly and sound and hygienic? Are they leading you towards a further faith or are they leading you further from faith? You know, Paul, in the opening lines of this, this book, <coughs> excuse me, this letter, he gives us this pretty kind of what I would say a very rich and very full description of kind of his mission statement, his personal mission statement, if you will. And so listen to what he says, and then we're going to go back, and we're going to try to break it down a little bit. So he says this in verse 1. Paul, a servant of God. I'm, I'm God's servant. I'm God's slave. And an apostle of Jesus. I'm a messenger of Jesus, of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And which now, at his appointed season, he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior. If we go back to the first verse, Paul says this, look, people. He says, my hope, my desire, my plan, my goal, my motivation for everything I do is I want to further your faith. If you're here, I want to move you further. If you you think about rising church, this would be deeper and more vibrant. I want to move you. If you're at point A, I want to get you to point B. If you're at point B, I want to get you to point C. If you're at point C to point D, E, F, I want to move you further. I accept you where you are. I love you where you are, but I want better for you. So I want to move you further. And so how does he further our faith? He says that that verb further is transferred over past the and. And their knowledge of the truth. He says, I can further their faith if I further their knowledge of the truth. i got to fill them with what is true, what is godly, what is right. That's what I want to fill them with because if I fill them with those things and they are furthered and they're deeper and they're more vibrant in their faith and their knowledge of God, here's what it's going to lead to. It's going to lead, right there, that leads to godliness. Godliness. What does that mean? Godliness means you and God in a right relationship, in alignment with each other, where you are being like God. You're being godly, right? A life that is in good, proper working order. No longer a big, fat liar. No longer an untamable wild animal. No longer a lazy glutton. But godly, like God. My character and my outward behavior becoming reflections of who God is. In fact, think of godliness like this, okay? Godliness is God's likeness in me. 
We are all created in God's likeness, but we don't reflect God's likeness. So it's saying, I am now a reflection of who God is because his character and my character are in alignment and agreement. That's what godliness is, God's likeness in me. And if I appoint Jesus or God as my elder, my leader, my guide, my coach, my teacher, my rabbi, my influencer, my authority, he is going to show me how to walk and where to go. Like a good shepherd, he's going to be like, don't go over there. Go over here. This is where it's better. This is where life is and full and abundant life. Not over there. Not over there. Stick to the course. That's what he's going to do. He's going to show me how to live like him. Follow his example. Follow his lead. And what happens when our faith and our knowledge of God are furthered and thus we are becoming more like God, reflections of who God is towards God's likeness, He says, ultimately, that leads us to the hope of eternal life. It leads us to hope. And I don't know about you guys, but when I look around the world, it looks a lot like maybe Crete did 2,000 years ago. Anybody need some hope? I don't know what your situation is for every single person in this room, but I'm pretty sure you could use some hope. Some hope of eternal life hope. You know, in the days leading up to our trip to Mexico, how did I get through some of those rough periods or those rough patches or those things where things didn't go the way I wanted to? How did I make it through the chaos and the mess of life? What did I do? I looked forward to our trip. Does that make sense? That was going to be a place where I'm going to have some peace and I'm going to have some joy and I'm going to eat a whole bunch of food. And I I didn't even know if it was going to be good or not, but I was looking forward to it, right? Anybody do that in life? Anybody right now looking forward to a vacation in your future? Maybe you have a cruise planned and all-inclusive to the DR. Uh, maybe you're planning to go to the cabin. Maybe you're going to go cave, climb in a cave or something. Uh, I don't know what it is for you that you look forward to, but those things that you have in front of you, they help you get through the muck of life currently because you have hope in the future. Does that make sense? And so it gets you through the muck. That's kind of what he's saying is that when you have godliness, it leads you to hope. And the hope of eternal life is what gets you through the chaos and the mess because you have something that's coming that you can look ahead to. And let, trust me, it's going to be way better than the all-inclusive that Kimberly and I stayed at, even though it was probably the nicest place I've ever been and probably the best food I've ever eaten and definitely the best Shirley Temples I've ever had, Right? And it's like, no, 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 you're not just looking ahead to, like, a a vacation. No, you're looking ahead to your future home, your inheritance, to heaven. It's going to be amazing. Not temporary, but your eternal place of rest. And I love what Paul says in this passage, if you go back to it, because he's like, look, people, God is bringing this into effect. And the reason that you can believe that you can have eternal hope, something to look forward to no matter how bad it gets, that you have something to look forward to is because, first off, he gives us three reasons. He says, first off, because God does not lie. He says, God who does not lie. You know who does lie? Satan, the father of all lies, who is the, the king of false advertising, the king of bait and switch, the king of making you think you're getting this, but then he's like, nope. Right? That's what he does. And so he is unreliable. He's like a Cretan. Where do you think the Cretans learned it from? Right? But he's saying, no, God does not operate that way. When God says something, it is true. You can take it to the bank. It's dependable because he does not lie. God is a God of truth. He's not a swindler. He's not a cheat. He's true. It's real. And then he says, second, says, God made this promise of eternal life. Before the beginning of time. Let your brain fry on that for a second. God came up with this plan for us to have the hope of eternal life, and he did so. He promised it when? Before the beginning of time. Anybody know what the beginning of time was? Anybody there? I know we've got some old people here, right? Anybody there? <laughs> beginning of time? When the universe started moving, okay, when the planets started doing their circles and you went around to the thing that took a year to get around, that was the beginning of time. It's like before the beginning of time, God had a plan for your salvation, had a plan to give you his grace before time. That's kind of a crazy thing. 
And then he says this third thing. He says, when God made this promise of eternal life, which he made from the beginning of time, he appointed, and which now at his, at God's appointed season, he has brought to light. He has illuminated. He shined light on. He's like, it's here, people. It's happened. In all of the timeline of history, God's like, I'm going to save them. It's just a question of when and the circumstances. And he's like, and I'm going to give an appointed time in the timeline of history when I'm going to insert myself and I'm going to inject myself and I'm going to bring salvation to them. That's what he's saying. I'm going to intervene and I'm going to shine light on my plan of salvation that nobody has a clue about except for me, and it's here. Now, if you fast forward a few verses, Titus 2.11, he says, For the grace of God has now appeared that offers salvation to all people. Paul says this promise of eternal life, which, again, God promised from the beginning of time, in which God appointed a specific time to make it happen, is now. It's appeared. It's happened. And by the way, FYI, it's by the grace of God. By the grace of God. In other words, it's completely unmerited, unearned, undeserved. In fact, think about it this way. Your salvation, my salvation, has absolutely nothing to do with you and your character or me and my character. And it's got everything to do with God and God's character. Did you catch that? It's got nothing to do with you. You didn't do anything to get it, deserve it, to own it. Nothing. Nothing. It is, you did nothing. Nothing to do with you, your character, what you've done, and everything to do with God and God's character and what he has done. I hope you catch that. We'll come back to it in a few minutes. The gift of salvation that God gives is offered to all people. Not some people, not most people, not 20% people. All people. But the key word in this, offered. It's offered to all people. And there's a di big difference between something being offered and something being accepted. And something being received. He's like, it's been offered to all people. Salvation is being offered to all people. And it's here. It's appeared. It's now. There's no more waiting for it. God, God's grace has now appeared. Kind of reminds me, several years ago, a lot of you guys know my good friend Stuart. He used to be on staff here at Rising Church. He was like the tech guy, the guy who liked to play with all this stuff, and like video stuff and all that, right? Um, <coughs> well, once upon a time, he shows up at my house unannounced, okay? Anybody like when people show up at your house unannounced? No. But I'm pretty used to it because back in the day before we had this place that God gave us, the hub, uh, almost everything that we did at Rising Church outside of Sunday morning happened at my house. So every single leadership meeting, staff meeting, elder meeting, prayer meeting, you name it, was at our house. So people were always coming to our house. But Stuart showed up not at one of those times. So he shows up, it's like Wednesday, like 9 a.m. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, what, what are you here for? Like, what's going on? We don't have a meeting today. And basically, long story short, is that we have a, a family plan, and our family plan has a, ha, at one point had like 10 people on it. Had like a couple random people. Brian and Brittany were on there. Katie Hove is still on there. Uh, Stuart was on there. Paige was on there. I mean, that was our family plan, right? And so on the family plan, he wanted to get his new iPhone. Because anybody who knew Stuart knows he's an iPhone freak, right? So he's like, iPhone, 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 right? And at the time, I know it's going to sound like ancient history, it was the iPhone 6. I mean, what are we up to, like 82 at this point? I don't even know where we're at, like iPhone 103. Uh, no, it was the iPhone 6. And so he was super excited about the iPhone 6 because it was the appointed season when it was going to be delivered. And they wouldn't deliver it to his house because I was the primary holder on the family account. And so they only delivered it to my house. And so he's like, I got to go to Aaron's house to get my new iPhone, which is going to be delivered today. And so he shows up like, I'm just going to hang out and wait for it. And I'm like... All right, well, make yourself at home, you know. So he's just, like, sitting there drinking his coffee, you know, like, waiting for this iPhone delivery. Uh, and finally, after, like, three hours, he gives up, like, ah, I'm hungry, I'll go home. Uh, and so can you imagine when I texted him on my probably, like, iPhone 1? Uh, you know, like, <laughs> I text him this, e this text message saying, it has arrived. And I'm telling you, like, I don't know if he drove, like, 103 miles an hour, but he was there within five minutes, like, just, like, at the door, like, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, 
iPhone, iPhone, give me my iPhone, give me my iPhone. I want my iPhone, right? Just give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. He was so excited. He was like a kid, a five-year-old kid on Christmas or a five-year-old kid getting his Shirley Temples, right? Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Right? And he got it. And he was so excited because it was the appointed time, and it arrived. That's what Paul is saying here. He's like, the appointed time that God planned from the beginning of time, it's happened. It's here. It has arrived. God's grace has appeared in Jesus. God's plan of salvation has finally shown up. We don't have to wait any longer. It's here, people. Celebrate. Yippee. That's what Paul is saying. And he continues in the next verse, Titus 2.12. He says, it, the grace of God which has now appeared, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness, not God's likeness in us. Say no to worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait. While we wait for what? The blessed hope. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. Eager to do what is good, God's likeness in them. These then are the things that you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. I love what he says. He's like, look, look, Titus, if you're going to appoint eldership in these different churches, you're going to help these people follow the right kinds of people, you're going to need to encourage them with these things. You've got to teach these things over and over and over again. You need to encourage, come alongside. And that's what it means, come alongside and call and invite someone. Let's go this way. Rebuke. He's like, if necessary, you need to rebuke them. you got to reprove them. you got to tell them what you are doing is not correct. It's not right. And do it with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. <coughs> and why would Titus need to rebuke these young Cretan believers? Because the grace of God, which has now appeared, it teaches us to say what to ungodliness? No! That's not God's likeness. I do not want that. That's a worldly passion and desire. It's not in alignment with what God wants. So no, I'm not going that direction any longer. I'm following him. I'm following his lead. It teaches us to say no. That's what a furthered faith and a furthered knowledge and maturity and deeper, more vibrant, that's what it looks like. Good working order that leads, guides, directs, teaches, influences us to say no to whatever is not in alignment and agreement with what God says. Because the reality is, you can't claim to follow Jesus and keep living an ungodly life. That's not in God's likeness. Those two don't go together. You can't say yes to what is contrary to what God says or his character or who he is. That's not God's likeness in you. So instead, we say yes. I say yes to God's pattern, God's way, God's beliefs, God's good, pleasing, perfect will. That's what I want. And according to what Paul just says here in verse 12, that means self-controlled. To a, an island full of wild animals, self-controlled, upright, godly. God's likeness in us lies, I love this, in the present age while we wait. While we wait for God's, the appearing of God's glory. Paul says, look people, we live in the present age. This period of time, check it out, between God's grace appearing, which appeared in Jesus, and it's a here, it's now, it's arrived, right? And God's glory, when we will have the eternal hope uh, of eternal life, when we have that, we live in the in-between period, between these two things, between these two realities. And so we don't have to wait anymore for God's grace to appear, but we do have to wait now for God's glory to appear, whether it appears at my death or appears at his return. That's where I live in the in-between time, the present, while we wait for the appearing of God's glory. Back when I was in middle school and high school, I know you guys love it when I sing these old youth group songs, right? And I know nobody's going to know this one except for maybe my sister. Uh, she's going to remember exactly what I'm talking about, right? Uh, you love it when I sing these to you. But this one this morning, for your viewing opportunity, uh, not only am I going to sing it, but this one has hand motions, okay? 
Anybody remember when you used to have hand motion worship songs? Anybody remember that, those good old days, right? So this one's got both. So if you feel free to, to do these with me if you would like to. Here's how the song goes. Melanie can help sing it with me. Here we go. It went like this. Maybe Julie knows this one. I don't know. It went, love them in the morning when you see the sun arising. Anybody know this one? Love them in the evening because he took you through the day. And even in between time when you feel the pressure coming. Remember that he loves you and he promises to stay. Anybody? Anybody remember that one? Melanie, you remember that one? Yeah, it's a great song, right? A little goofy, a little kind of whatever. Uh, if you like that song, you can buy my new EP, Preacher Boy's Greatest Hits. Uh, jams and pop culture references. Thank you uh, back there for Preacher Boy. Um, he's saying we all live in the present age, in the in-between time. When you feel the pressure and the anxiety and the stress and the chaos of living in this world, that's where we live between God's grace appearing and God's glory appearing. We live in between those two things. And in Jesus, God's eternal grace has arrived, but we haven't experienced God's glory and the eternal life just yet. And that's why we have hope, because we have something to look forward to that God has not lied to us about. And it's going to be far better than any all-inclusive resort you've, any of us have ever been to, because this is an all-inclusive, all-expenses-paid, all-invited paradise in heaven with him. That's our future. That's what we have to look for. And Jesus is saying, follow me, because who you follow determines where you end up. He's like, that's where I'm trying to get you to. And if you will have God's likeness in you, then you're going to be ready for that, because that's where we're heading. If you will follow me. Now, reality is prior to us accepting God's offer of grace, which he's offered to all of us, none of this was true. In fact, this is what it says in Titus 3.3. 3. At one time, saying we too, he's including himself, he's saying all of us, every single one of us in this room, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. Basically, we were saying yes to ungodliness, we lived in malice and envy and being hated and hating one another. That was our reality. We were saying yes to ungodliness, not no to ungodliness. That was our reality. Let me ask you this. Anybody here ever make a pros and cons list? Some major life decision, you're like, I got to weigh, weigh the options. I got to you know where you're going to go to college, you're going to get married, uh, blah, 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 whatever decision it was made, right? What it was. Have you ever thought about if God were to make a pro-con list for why he should intervene and step into our mess and save us and deliver us, what that list would look like, pros and cons, pros and cons, pros and cons to intervening, pros and cons to saving, pros and cons to delivering, pros and cons to stepping into this mess versus saying, I'm out of here and walking away, pros and cons. I think this list of, that he just gave us gives us a pretty good list of cons. Here's reasons why I should not intervene, why I shouldn't get involved, right? Because first off, these people are foolish. They're just foolish. They're not smart. I mean, they live as if I, God, do not exist. And I do exist. And like it says in Romans 1, I have made that abundantly clear. But they're pretending that I don't exist because they are suppressing the truth, even though I've made it very clear and evident that I exist. But they don't want to believe in me. And so they're fool that's foolishness. Con. They're foolish. Let's see. What else? Yeah, you know what? These people are super disobedient. Like, if I tell them to do something, they're like, oh, I'm not doing that. Like, they're like a teenage kid, right? If I say do this, they're like, I'm going to do the opposite of that, right? They're like, no, they're like, that's, sorry, none of you guys do that at all. Um, right? It's like, they're just like willfully disobedient. Like, I tell them this is where you should go. I say, hey, don't go over there. Go over here. And they're like, I'm going over there, Right? And that's what they do. They're disobedient. They reject my designs. They want to live according to their rules, not mine, because they think they know more than I do. Let's see what else. Man, they're just deceived. And not just deceived like fooled and bamboozled, but willfully like they choose. They want it. Over and over again, they choose to appoint eldership and leadership and influence and authority to things that are unworthy uh, and things that they know are wrong, that they know is contrary to what I say. They're deceived. 
And let's see, what else? Well, because they're deceived, I mean, really, honestly, they're, they're enslaved to all these passions and desires that are contrary to me. Uh, they kind of just do whatever they want. Their God is their stomach. Uh, and so their feelings, whatever they feel they want to do, right? They have no self-control whatsoever. What else? Con. I don't know. These people are full of malice. I mean, they look like really like people do something against them, and they just like want the worst uh, for those people. Uh, they wish bad upon other people. I mean, they're full of envy. There's another one. Con. These people are so envious. They just like they hate each other. They're completely selfish. They're looking out for themselves. So they they lie. They steal. They kill. They destroy. They hate each other. They've turned my world into a big hot hate mess. Uh, con. 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 Okay. Well, that's super depressing. Let's kind of shift. Let's go over to the pros list. What are the pros, the reasons why I should intervene and I should get involved and I should save? What should, why, why? And it's like, mm, hmm, cricket, cricket, hmm, Bueller, Bueller, anyone, anyone? Like, there's nothing, a big fat question mark. Like, what, there are 10,000 reasons why God should walk away and not get involved and very few, if any, reasons why he should so why? Just pause for a second. Why should God intervene and offer us salvation? Why? 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 And why did God come up with a rescue plan for our salvation, promised from the beginning of time, in which now is the appointed season he has brought to light? Why? Why? I really wrestle this one out. Why? Well, next verse, Titus 3, 4. Here's the reason. Somebody said it. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he, not we, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that, having been justified by his grace, by what he did, we might become heirs having the hope of what? Eternal life, because it's coming. This is a trustworthy thing. He's saying this because he's saying, basically, he's saying everything that we just said, it was kind of believed to be an early creed of the church. Like, here's what we believe at our core as followers of Jesus. And so memorize it, think about it, write a song about it, and do some hand motions to it, right? Whatever. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things. Titus, as you're teaching, stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good, God's likeness in me. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Why did God save us and rescue us and intervene and offer us salvation when we did not deserve it and we could never earn it? Because of his mercy, because of his kindness, because of his grace, because of his love, it's just who God is. Kindness, mercy, love, grace aren't things that God has to work at and try to do. He does them automatically, naturally, inherently, because that's who God is is. God is love. God is grace. God is mercy. God is kindness. God is also just and holy and righteous. He's not some kind of polyester blend of the things where it's like, well, he's 10% this and 10% that. And 10 no, he's 100% of all those things. And because that's his character, that's what he does. So your salvation has nothing to do with you and your character and absolutely 100% everything to do with God and God's character because God is good and God is loving and God is kind and he gives us what we do not deserve. And so he came up with a plan from the beginning of time for our salvation that he enacted in Jesus, God's grace appearing. And now we get to look forward to God's glory appearing. And so that's what gets us through the muck. He didn't intervene because of anything that we did or could do. He did it because that's who he is. And it's the kindness of God which leads us to repentance, to change, to say no to ungodliness and yes to God's likeness in me. It teaches me to say no to worldly passions and desires and yes to whatever it is that God says, hey, go over here. This is where life is. Do you trust me? Will you listen to me? We love because he first loved us. 
Listen to me. We offer grace and kindness and mercy to others even when they don't deserve it because that's what God did for us. And if my faith is being furthered and my knowledge of God is being furthered, then that's going to lead to God's likeness in me and I'm going to start living like he would have me live. But for now, In this earthly, temporary life, I live in the waiting period. God's grace is already here, Jesus. God's glory appearing, eternal life, heaven, out of this mess, deliverance. I'm still looking forward to that, and that's what's going to get me through whatever you may be facing today. Because God does not lie. And God has promised it to us. So hold on to hope. This week, when you feel the pressure coming, remember that he loves you and he promises to stay as you live in the in-between time. And if you haven't yet taken hold of this offer, don't wait. Because your waiting period in between time is relatively short in the span of eternity. So don't waste any more time following and leading things that are leading you away from God. Be like, I want to appoint eldership and leadership and authority influence in my life to things that are going to further me in my faith. Because I need that hope. And I need that security. Who you follow determines where you end up. So appoint eldership, leadership, authority to Jesus and allow him to line you up with God's likeness so you can be ready for what your future holds. Say yes to God's likeness in you. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Father, I thank you that you are good. I thank you that you are kind. I thank you that you are loving. It's just who you are. It's your character. At its core, you are just, you are holy, you are righteous, You are full of grace and mercy and love. And Father, I pray that that would lead us towards repentance, turning away from our old lives and turning to the new life that you have for us, that God, your likeness would be found in me because I was created in your likeness, but God, maybe I'm not reflecting your likeness. And God, I want your likeness to be in me. And God, I want to be, have that secure hope of eternal life to get me through whatever, whatever this life throws my direction. That I know where I'm going and I have that to look forward to. And I know that it's, it's real and it's true. And it's going to be way better than an all-inclusive vacation to Mexico. But God, it's going to be for all eternity in heaven and paradise with you. And if that's you, if you're in this room, you're like, I don't, I don't have that security. I don't have that confidence. I don't have that assurance. God's offer stands for you. All you need to do is accept it. And receive it. You cannot earn it. You can only receive it. So maybe if that's you and you're like, I need that, then pray this prayer to God. God knows your heart. God, I am not okay. I am, I'm not in alignment with your character and who you are. I'm foolish and I'm disobedient and I've done wrong and I'm sinful. And God, you should turn your back on me because the cons list is massive. But God, I thank you that out of your great love, out of your great mercy, out of your kindness of who you are, that you you have made a way for me to be with you for all eternity. So now I can have eternal hope. And so I accept your forgiveness. I accept your grace. I accept your mercy. I accept your love. Come into my life and make it new because that's what you do. Come into my life, and I want to repent of my past, and I look forward to your likeness in me, which will take time. But God, that's what I desire. That's what I want. Pray that prayer. Just tell him, I I throw myself at your mercy and your grace. I accept your offer provided in Jesus, in Jesus alone. And for all of us, think about that each and every day. Maybe it's starting with this week. It's not about you and what you've done or what you thought you could earn or your character. It's about God. And God's character and God's provision and God's grace, which he has poured out on you. Thank you. God, we just thank you.
be thank you for that. And kind of like Paul, became a, a slave, a servant of God, and an apostle, a messenger of that message. God, I pray that we would do the same. And even as we walk outside and we eat and we gorge on some yummy food, God, that we would be looking at all these missionaries that we support as a church body. God, that that's what we're doing. That's what we're about. Like Miguel said, it's not something that they do. It's something we do. We're all a part of that team. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to live in that, God, with your likeness in us, reflecting that to the world. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.